in any case, yeah. So I, um, if you kind of go through uh, my little bio here, I'll bring up the video game monitor thing here again. But you know, I've been at Concordia 14 years, I already mentioned that. My research area is programming language theory and collaborative virtual worlds. And what this translates into is that I write a lot of software and I spend a lot of time in virtual reality. Um, so I'll dig into both of those and I write software for uh, virtual reality for VR as well. Um, so at my house, I have my, you know, normal, I'm on a MacBook Pro, but I virtualize various operating systems. So I run Linux and Windows on the same machine. So, you know, it's a, whatever's the right tool for the job, we'll talk about that a little bit today. But then I also have a, a 49 inch, 120 hertz uh, 4K monitor uh, above me, you know, obviously for work purposes only. Um, but uh, 4K games look great on there. <laughs> so, uh, so that's, so when I look up, you know, like right now I'm looking at the screw, my laptop screen where the camera is, but if I look up a lot of times if I'm in class, my students will see me, you know, messing with stuff up above here and stuff. That's because that's where my, my monitor is. But um, yeah, so anyways, that's the, uh, the scoop. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about um, uh, our program and our department and all this stuff. And then I want to talk a little bit about uh, some computer architecture stuff uh, today, um, just to give you a, a, a taste on, you know, kind of my style and whether you love it or really love it, I guess would be your two options. Um, <laughs> uh, but so just to brag a little bit about the department in general, um, you know, what do we have? So one thing that's kind of cool about Concordia, and uh, so like I said, I've been here for 14 years, and I was in um, um, Illinois State School, uh, Western Illinois University. I taught there for six years before I came here, and uh, uh, Illinois is just south of Wisconsin, and uh, so if you know Chicago, uh, I'm about an hour north of Chicago now. I was about an hour south of Chicago before. Um, so that's kind of the, the, the scoop. Um, but one kind of cool thing about the computer science department at Concordia uh, is we have a lot of toys, um, which is actually kind of interesting. You know, like you would think kind of a relatively small private school compared to a large state school um, would have very different, uh, um, I don't know, budgets, agendas, things like that. But I I've, I've, I found that to be completely true, but in the benefit of the relatively small private school. Um, Larger schools, I have found, have stayed much more traditional in their computer science education and tend not to delve too much into the newfangled stuff. Where one thing we like doing at Concordia is, you know, we're preparing students for getting jobs, right? Um, where a lot of state schools might be preparing people to go and get PhDs or something like that for a master's program. And not that you can't go on and do a PhD from our program, but our focus is a, a master's program that's applied, that you can go and take those skills and go get a high paying job and do what you want with that. And part of what you need for that is to have practical experience working with technology that, ex that exists today, not what was cool 20 years ago, um, something like that. So, I mean, at any point in time, we have the latest, greatest, coolest, uh, VR stuff and video game stuff and all sorts of things like that. But, you know, one thing we've um, kind of bragged about this last year was uh, uh, we opened our new um, um, business building. So we got this all glass building, looks really cool. And on the main floor of that building, uh, the computer science department runs the makerspace. And this idea of a makerspace has kind of been like this buzzword that's gone around over the last several years, but it's effectively a space where you make stuff, <laughs> hence makerspace. But from a computer science perspective, what's kind of cool about this is for a long time now, computer science has been a, a creative field where when we have a, a dream about something, we can write software that automates it, right? You know, whether it's a video game or, you know, a business application like Microsoft Word or Excel or something like that, or, or you know, a, even a website, something to deal with marketing, stuff like that. So, you know, we've had these tools where we can leverage the computer and software to do stuff um, because that doesn't really cost us anything but time. Where for a long time, we, as, as normal problem solvers, and actually let me pause for a second and just roll back to my previous statement. 
what has really opened the world to computer scientists from being able to get our software out to the masses probably started with Apple, right? With their app store. You know, before I, I've been writing software for uh, a, a little bit. Um, uh, so I think I released my first uh, project when I was 18 um, that I sold professionally and I'm a little bit older than that now. Uh, so, but back then you had to work with a publisher to try to get your software on the shelves at Best Buy or Sears. Sears used to sell software. <laughs> um, so, uh, uh, but you know, it, it was not an easy field to break into. Uh, we're now, so what happened with Apple, let's call it out 12, 13 years ago, I guess now, um, you know, they released their app store where they said, look, here's the technology, the iPhone, let's say, and here's the software development tools. Now we're going to give you, the developer, a platform to write your software and get it out there to the millions of subscribers. Now, sure, Apple took their cut and stuff, you know, and that's fine. They're, they're a for-profit business. But what they did is they made it easy for people like you and me to write software and get it to the masses without having to go and negotiate these uh, publishing contracts and whether they were interested in helping us write the software and things like that. We could just sit there, write the code and get it out to the world. Same thing's true with Android and now it's become a very you know normal thing for us to be able to write software and publish it. You wanna write a video game using Unity or something, you could publish it on Steam. You know, they'll charge you a hundred bucks a year for your subscription on Steam or whatever, your subscription on the Apple App Store, but you know, that's small price to pay for having now a, a platform for getting your software out there. So as computer scientists, we've enjoyed this idea of being able to take our creations um, and get them out to people um, a lot over the last, you know, 10, 15 years. But even before that, we had mechanisms for doing it. But what we've kind of lost is individual problem solvers uh, over the last many, many years. Uh, well, actually, I don't know about lost, we just never had it, was this idea of creating physical widgets. If we wanted to make something, um, uh, you know, like the example I use with folks is like uh, my or last this last year, my wife wanted me to start hanging my uh, coat on the back of our door coming in from the garage. But we have a very weird door. It's like a really thick storm door, but there's a very, very, very narrow gap at the very top of it. So you can't just go out to a store and buy an over the door hanger thing and have it fit. Door wouldn't shut anymore. Well, so historically, if I wanted to invent a door hanger, let's say, if I wanted to take my you know design thing, you know, go into a CAD software and design some three D object, you know, I would then have to go and take it to some place that would either you know cast it in plastic or you know maybe make it out of metal at first they might charge me two or three hundred bucks to give me my current my initial prototype and then when that one doesn't fit i have to go back to them two or three times and before you know it i've spent a thousand dollars just uh, prototyping a door hanger now hopefully you make that back by selling a million of the door hangers right but you know the idea is that's not that practical for you know, daily problem solving, and it doesn't really support the idea of innovation with uh, um, us as, as ex technology experts. So now we have these 3D printers that used to be very expensive, but now the price has come way down. So to solve that problem of the door hanger thing, I went to my 3D printer, I created a couple different, you know, I just did a little tiny prototype of just the part that goes over the door to make sure it would shut. So each one took maybe a half hour or so to print and maybe, you know, three cents in plastic, finally got it to fit. Then I put four door hangers on the print bed and printed it overnight, probably took seven hours. And I had four, four uh, full door hangers for maybe 50 cents that fit my exact door. And that's something you can do with something like a 3D printer. Now, you know, so we run the largest print space in Wisconsin. We now have a hundred 3D printers. Um, We've almost doubled our capacity in the last uh, couple of months because our makerspace has been um, 3D printing uh, uh, face masks and also face shields for the COVID uh, pandemic. So we've been uh, partnering with a lot of different people and we've been running kind of the 3D printing space in the greater Milwaukee area for creating those aspects. I mean, we're using the 3D printers to make the mask, but then we have silicon molds that we're pouring. So we use the 3D printers to make the molds to pour the silicon in. So, you know, it's kind of a, 
you know, we're using the right tool for the job. So the 3D printer is part of the solution, but not the entire solution. Um, but, you know, in any case, the, using a 3D printer as, as an example, um, as technologists or as just human beings who are great problem solvers, uh, we solve all the problems that we have around us in terms of the tools that we have available to us. And those tools, um, we can only use if we understand them, right? So when somebody first, you know, if you've never used a 3D printer uh, before, just out of curiosity, you can put it in the chat if you want. Uh, how many of you have used a 3D printer before? I think I'll, there we've got a couple people. Um, now, what happens when you first get a 3D printer? What do you do? Well, you print out Baby Yoda and Groot and all the, all the, you know, uh, you know, fun things that you want to do. And, but after you get past that initial, oh, I'm going to make all these things that these models and stuff that are just out there, what do you do? You start thinking, oh, well, how could I now use this tool? You know, you know, how could I use this tool that will, um, you know, to solve other problems, like take that coat hanger thing. You know, that's such this little mundane problem that isn't that exciting. But the fact that I understood the tool and my wife gave me a directive, I was able to say, well, I can make that. Um, and actually just for Mother's Day uh, uh, last week, my mom had said that she, uh, you know, she has a tissue box on her counter at home. And every single time the, uh, she wipes down the counter, the bottom of the box of tissues gets wet. And apparently they sell these covers that go over the top of the tissue box, but nothing that goes on the bottom of the tissue box. So I made her a custom thing that goes in the bottom of her tissue box, and then I made a top thing that goes over it so she can make it match her kitchen decor. Uh, that way she can buy the uh, um, the, the flowers. Uh, you know, I guess when it's on sale, you, there's all sorts of different patterns on the tissue boxes you can get, so she doesn't have to worry about the matching. So I made her a thing that encloses whatever ugly uh, uh, tissue box she might've gotten, and now it always matches what's in her kitchen. You know, and that's something her and I chatted about on the phone. She said, oh, well, I'm looking for this. Do you know where I can find that? And I just designed it. Um, wasn't, you know, really a big deal. It took a lot, 14 hours to print. But once you design it and you get it printing, then you just walk away and you let it do its thing. But in any case, the idea here is that you have this tool that you now understand how to use. And now you can integrate it into your problem solving approach. Okay, and that's even something we're going to talk about today, but that's that's kind of computer science in a nutshell, right? The more tools that we learn how to use, whether it's technology tools or, you know, tools in the normal world, the, the, the broader um, set of problems we can try to solve. All right, so, you know, that's that's kind of a focus of you know, my teaching approach in computer science just across the board. Everything's about gaining expertise in tools and then choosing the right tool for the job to solve these problems. All right. Um, so in any case, we have a whole bunch of 3D printers. And what's cool about that from a student perspective is uh, A, printers are kind of expensive. I mean, they've come down in price a lot, but they're still three, $400 a piece. Um, and then also you have plastic and also liquid resin for the resin printers, and that's expensive. Well, all of our computer science students have free access to the printers and have unlimited materials. So we want you in there designing things and inventing things. We have lots of entrepreneurial type of workshops and things like that where you can design something, enter a competition and, and win money, you know, win, uh, win things uh, just by playing with new tools that are gonna benefit you in your future. So we have these facilities available for you. Uh, we have two high-end laser cutting machines, um, which are pretty cool actually, once you, again, you learn like, okay, well, it's a laser cutter, what am I gonna do with that? Well, once you kind of figure it out and decide, oh, I've done this, that, and the next thing, now you can start applying it to other problems. Um, we, I mentioned before, one of my areas is big into virtual reality, so we have 20 virtual reality headsets and growing, so we always have the latest, greatest uh, VR stuff, um, so that should be something that's a lot of fun to, uh, um, you know, play around with, uh, <laughs> somebody say money I'm already in. <laughs> well, the good news is if you're looking at computer science, money shouldn't really be your, your issue once you're done being a poor college student. 
that's the that's the, the punchline. And we'll talk about that a little bit as well. All right, so we have a bunch of VR stuff, so you can play around with that. Also, we write software for virtual reality. Uh, we have 16, uh, 16 machine PC gaming arena. Uh, this actually supports, so computer science uh, houses the uh, uh, university's esports team, uh, where they play video games for competition. Uh, I'm not very good at some of the games they're playing, but we host their arena, but we also have access to their uh, arena. So when they're not practicing and uh, um, uh, when they're not practicing or they're not having their uh, uh, competitions, we have access to it and it's in our little area in computer science. Um, let's see. Uh, we have an actual computer lab with 25 uh, high-end 27-inch iMacs in there and they're all tri-booting, uh, Mac OS, Windows 10, and Linux. Um, so that's for a physical presence, but we also have a virtual machine server array um, that, uh, you know, for the, the, the geeks in the crowd, uh, it has 72 processors and 384 gigs of RAM. So some pretty good system resources. Um, so what we can actually do is we can spin up an entire lab environment. Let's say you're in a security class or something like that. And um, they want to do something with like penetration testing. Um, the professor can create a little Linux environment with all the software that you need for it and then spin up 19 copies of it. And then you can sit in class on your laptop or sit at home and have your own machine that's running on our uh, virtual machine array uh, that allows you to do your homework without having to create specialized software on your machine or, or something like that. Um, that allows us to kind of control your environment to make sure that you know we don't have to main, uh, deal with 19 different uh, students who have different pieces of software on their computer and things aren't working, but it also gives you the flexibility of not necessarily having to come to campus every single time you need to get something done. Because um, one thing we, you know, you sometimes run into with, um, you know, let's call it poor, uh, poor college students is, you know, they might not have the latest, greatest cutting edge laptop that allows them to run all the stuff they might need to run. Well, now, as long as you have a computer with an internet connection, you'll be able to do your stuff because you're going to be using a computer that's remotely located that does have the system resources that you'll need. So that also benefits you from a being able to do your stuff remotely perspective. Um, so that's kind of the, the highlights of the, the, the cool things that we have uh, in the department. Uh, but let me kind of keep, keep cooking here. Uh, let's see where we're at here. So our faculty, so uh, besides myself, uh, we have uh, Dr. Gary Locklear. His specialties are software engineering and computer science theory. Uh, Dr. Bob Wall, kind of database security uh, and also gifted in computer animation. Uh, so if you're interested in that at all, he's always looking for folks to work with him on some of his animation projects. Uh, Dr. Farah Kem, she's uh, database compilers and cybersecurity. Uh, and she actually uh, it works over at our sister campus in Ann Arbor, Michigan, so across Lake Michigan. Uh, Professor Josh, Lock Josh Locklear, he's uh, offering systems and artificial intelligence. Um, and then uh, the Reverend Dr. Gonzalez, he specializes in everything. Uh, there's a picture of him there and then here he is. Um, so he's, uh, once you'll, you'll learn the whole backstory of that whole thing once you come to campus. That's it's a little bit uh, of a weird thing, but he, he travels the world with my wife and I, so <laughs> he has a whole Facebook following and stuff, but it's, um, yeah, it's a thing. So in any case, <laughs> he has his own business cards in the department and everything. So I'm not sure, uh, um, yeah, <laughs> always lots of inside jokes. That's a true statement. It's, it sometimes gets bad. All right. So that's kind of our faculty there. And, um, uh, what's nice about uh, our department, I, I believe, is that we have a very well-rounded faculty where each of us kind of has our specialties in our area. So all your faculty members are kind of teaching their favorite classes. So that allows them to be pretty passionate about what they're teaching. And because um, I'll tell you, from a teacher's perspective, the last thing you want to be able, you want to do is teach a class that you don't really like, because the students will sense that. Right. And, you know, nobody's nobody's excited about it. So, you know, we, we have a nice um, uh, a lot of expertise in the department with all the different fields and I think it really benefits the students in the uh, 
uh, in the end. So for you, uh, looking at our MSCS program, um, it's a, the total program is 30 total credits. Um, there are seven uh, technology core classes that you'll take uh, that everybody takes, depending, regardless of which concentration um, you are in. Um, and I can actually, I'll, I'll pop that up here in a, um, I can actually pop that up here now. I'll just show you those classes real quick. All right, so here's our master's program, 30 credit hours. Um, uh, now, it's an actually, it's an all online program. That it's offered in an all online format, but we also have a face-to-face -face format um, uh, for the program as well. So uh, for those of you who are gonna be looking at student visas and things like that, completely compatible, you won't have any issues. You'll have uh, all your face-to-face -face classes that you're going to, uh, uh, you're going to need, but there's 30 total credit hours, um, seven course uh, technology core. So every one of you will take a vocational computing class, an artificial intelligence class, a cybersecurity class, user experience, uh, computer networking class, mobile computer architecture, uh, applied RESTful APIs. Um, now this internship is not a required course, but for those of you who are doing uh, OPT, uh, or CPT, but you know, let's call it OPT initially, um, you're gonna need a course associated with that. So that's what that course exists for. So it's not a required course in the program. It's a, uh, a course that um, will allow you to, to meet your various status requirements, things like that. Um, so in any case, everybody who goes into the program will take all of those classes. So those are, that's, we call that our technology core. Then you'll pick one of two concentrations. So you can either go the software engineering route. So you have a, this would be what you would consider your traditional MSCS, you know, Masters of Computer Science degree. Um, so you have a software engineering route and then you also have an information systems route. So historically this would have been like an MSIT degree uh, in information technology. So for software engineering, you'll take an advanced algorithms course. You'll take a course on compilers where we actually create a compiler and you'll take a, a class on language theory where we actually write a programming language. Um, so you'll have me, any class that involves programming, you'll have me for it, is, is what it comes down to. Um, so that's our software engineering uh, concentration. Information systems, you'll take a second uh, networking course, uh, and then a systems design and the system administration class. So those are the, the two concentrations. So the differentiating factor is the three classes that you pick depending on which concentration you go into. Um, okay, so that's the, the, the program, but it is a 30 credits uh, program. Each class is uh, three credit hours. So you end up taking, let me go back to my other thing here. So you take seven courses plus three, 10 total courses. Each course lasts for uh, uh, eight weeks. So in a given semester, you would take a session A and a session B classes. Usually you would take at least nine credit hours. So maybe two classes in one session and one class in the other. Some people will do more than that, but you know, that's the, that's the, the deal. Okay. So um, I guess before I go on, is there any, because uh, I'm going to start telling you a little bit about the uh, CPU stuff, so I'm going to get into a little bit of lecture here, but uh, does anybody have any specific questions about the program before I jump into the, uh, the next portion of the show? Okay. Um, but feel free, you can email me later or talk to me uh, at the end. I think I have another presentation after this one, so email will probably be the, uh, um, the best. I'll actually just go ahead and... That's my email address, michael.litman at cuw.edu. So feel free to shoot me an email there and I'll be happy to answer any questions you have or if you want to... Uh, uh, jump on a um, Zoom chat or something like that at some point. Happy to help you. Um, 
Okay, so, uh, you know, let's, I want to talk about something within technology, because again, like before we were talking about uh, uh, 3D printing um, stuff and kind of like, here's a tool. And, uh, you know, once you learn how to use the tool, you can, you can start applying it to, to different things. Well, something we all take for granted, and this is uh, so from a, a professor perspective in computer science, um, I always find it uh, interesting when I ask a group, I say, you know, well, what's the CPU? Well, everybody always says, you know, well, it's the brains of the computer, and, you know, things like that. Well, or, well, what they say first is what it stands for, a central processing unit. And they say, well, it's kind of the brain of the computer. But what's interesting about it is we take for granted that all of our computers have these processors in them. But most of us don't actually know what the processor does. We don't know what it is. And at the end of the day, that when we talk about computing, at the end of the day, that CPU is the guy we're talking to. You know, when, when, we're, when we're trying to, as a human being, solve a problem, we're trying to tell a computer what to do. Ultimately, who we're talking to is a CPU. Okay, so when you think about programming languages and, and, and stuff like that, you know, it, it's so easy to get to bent out of shape and think, well, is it, you know, do I like C or C++ or Java or Python or, or whatever? Well, the thing is, is that, a, uh, and, and I, I teach this in the, at the undergrad level, but I always remind you about it in the grad level as well, is that the programming language does not matter. Programming is the skill set. That is, the skill set is how do I tell a computer what to do? And then you choose the language that best meets your needs for the problem you're currently trying to solve. All right, so on our meeting here, we have several different nationalities. So let's replace the CPU. Instead of me telling a computer what to do, let's say the problem I'm trying to solve is to communicate with another human being. All right, so if any one of us uh, walked up on the street and we started talking to each other, we're going to pick a language that we're going to agree upon that we both understand. All right. So chances are several of you uh, speak more than one or two languages. Um, I joke with my students that I'm fluent in in uh, Hindi and Telugu and Urdu, and I, but I'm not. <laughs> I know like three words. <laughs> um, but uh, so realistically. Um, we're probably going to have to pick English because you know English and that's all I know. <laughs> so we're going to have to pick that particular language because it's the right tool for the job. But the point is, is that no matter where we are in the world, no matter where we're from, what cultures we have, we have years and years and years of experience, practice, communicating with human beings, right? We think the same when you're talking to your, your friends in in, uh, in Hindi or in Telugu or in English, the same thoughts are going through your mind. Just the words you're spitting out sound a little different because you're using a different programming language, you're using a different communication protocol for talking to them because you've agreed upon that, right? So if I'm trying to tell a computer what to do, the communication protocol I use, whether it's Python or C++ or Java or any of those things, it doesn't matter. That's the right tool for the job. And, and the fascinating part about that is it's, we're not, we're not like meeting computers halfway. We're saying, look, I'm a human being. I want the power tool. So I want you to meet me 98% of the way. So when we think about a programming language like Java or C++, um, pick your, pick your favorite language, Python, you know, really that's trying to allow us to communicate with the computer in as human of a way as possible. Because at the end of the day, that CPU speaks binary, zeros and ones, all right? And I don't think any of us want to sit there with a little two, two uh, key keyboard just punching out zeros and ones all day long. We'd mess up pretty often, first of all, and it's not going to be any fun, all right? So we think about who we're talking to. If I walk into a room and I see a computer there and I think, oh, I have to communicate with that thing. Um, and I say, okay, well, what do we have in common? Well, he speaks binary and that's it. Just like you know, our example we just had of me where all I speak is English. Okay, he speaks binary and I'm like, well, I can work with binary and that's not a big deal, but it's tedious. It's not easy for a human being. And, you know, maybe not, I'm not gonna be very productive. I don't know if that's something I wanna do and talk to that computer directly. So that's why we have these things that sit between the CPU and the human being 
programming languages, operating systems, all these things that sit in there that make our lives easier. The mouse, the keyboard, these are all if, uh, convenience tools for us that make our lives uh, easier. All right, so um, what is the CPU? I like to think of the CPU as a, um, well, here, let's, I'll start with my little exercise here. So if all of us, you know, pick up our hand, I know it's probably cutting out here, we wiggle our thumb or you bend your fingers, you know, whatever it is, you know, nobody's overly impressed with those little moves, right? I can't be like, oh, ta-da, you know, I'm waving my hand or whatever. Nobody's impressed by that. Because, you know, like, oh, well, you can move your fingers, great. Well, you can turn your wrist, great. You can bend at the elbow, great. Okay, but now when you think about uh, on a daily basis, how you sometimes put those little moves together in a certain order, and now you're picking up a soda bottle, or you're turning the keys of the car, or you're taking a plate out of the microwave, whatever it is, you know, you, you're using all these little tiny little moves, these little tiny magic tricks that are not that impressive in and of themselves, but you're putting them together in an interesting sequence that allows you to solve a real problem. That's what a CPU is. This guy has a collection of little tiny moves, little tiny magic tricks that he knows how to accomplish. You know, move something from one place in memory to another place in memory. Jump from one instruction to another instruction farther down. Add to that list, you know, hundreds of uh, different things it knows how to do. And any of those individual things are not that useful in and of themselves. When I wiggle my thumb, nobody's overly impressed. That's not something that's gonna stand on its own very often, right? Maybe the thumbs up thing that stands on its own. But, you know, generally speaking, that's not gonna really stand on its own very often. But I start putting sequences of movements together and all of a sudden real problems start getting solved. That's what our CPU is. It's a collection of these magic tricks um, uh, that perform some very small task in and of themselves. But when I link them all together, you know, maybe I have 50, 60, 70 magic tricks in a row that when linked together actually solve some real problem and, you know, some text shows up on the screen or, you know, something like that. And now we're programming, right? But when we think about talking to the CPU, we don't really want to talk to the CPU at that granular level. I don't want to sit there and say, CPU, call instruction 0001011. Now call instruction 101111. Now call instruction blah, blah, blah. We would go insane pretty quickly. That's not what we like to do. We'd rather say, hey, you want to print hello world out to the screen? Well, you pop open Python, you type in the print command, and you say double quote, hello world, double quote, you run the program and behind the scenes, some magical interpreter is turning that into all those little instructions that the CPU needs to understand. But at the end of the day, we are talking to the CPU. We're just using that power tool. We're using that programming language like Python to write a couple of lines of code that's translating into 50, 60, 70 of those little magic trick instructions on the CPU and something actually occurs. All right, so that's the nature of our CPU. All right, why is this? Human beings like, um, uh, like power tools. Uh, and actually, just out of uh, curiosity, Kelsey, am I, what time am I cut off? What's my time Great for- Great question. So the um, undergraduate computer science starts at 11. Um, so we'll need time to do a little bit of a wrap up and then um, to get over onto the other link. Okay. So I would so say we got another- What time do you want me done by? Or excuse, um, like another 10 minutes? Okay, I can, I can work with that. <laughs> That's all I need to know. <laughs> when, when do I need to shut up? Um, so uh, we can all relate to this. Human beings like power tools, right? You know, you think about it like your your cars. You know, if you you, you have a car at home, um, you know, when I was uh, a lot younger, you know, driving a stick shift that was that was a cool thing to do. Well, now I want an automatic transmission. I don't want to do that extra work. You know, I want power door locks. I mean, if I had to like lean over and actually manually unlock my door, I mean, who needs who's going to do that? You know, there's all these conveniences that we've surrounded ourselves with and. You know, technology is the ultimate convenience, right? You know, we don't go to libraries or open up books anymore. We Google it. You know, we, we can't even order our food ourselves anymore. We go to the, I won't even order from a place unless they have an app. 
<laughs> so we uh, we go that uh, um, you know we like power tools, we like those conveniences, and we've become let's say addicted to them or whatever. But from a human being perspective, we expect those things. And in computer science, our industry is all about creating those power tools, creating those, and we create them in terms of other power tools that already exist. Right now we're talking about talking to the CPU and we've agreed that we're not gonna talk to the CPU directly. I'm not gonna speak zeros and ones to that thing. I'm gonna use a programming language which is intimidating enough and we're gonna let the CPU, we're gonna let something translate that into something the CPU can deal with. All right, so I wanna talk about the different number systems. Um, so every one of us is familiar with numbers, right? Uh, as human beings, we got 10 fingers, 10 toes. So we like the decimal number system, you know? So we think of things like uh, in, in packs of tens, all right? So like the number 123 is one pack of 100 plus two pack of tens plus three pack of ones. So 100 plus 20 plus three is 123. All right, so an important statement I'll make here is that a number is a number, regardless of how you represent it. Typically, if we're talking about computer science, we're going to, I'll just throw an extra slide in here. So for CS, we're gonna say, anytime we use decimal numbers, it's for humans, right? We like decimal numbers because we're used to them. Anytime we use binary, binary is base two. This is our zeros and ones. This is for the CPU. That's what he speaks. All right. Then we have octal, which is base eight. And this guy has the language zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. Those are the legal octets in the octal language just like we have the legal digits in the decimal language. Zero to nine are the digits we make all of our numbers out of. In octal, zero through seven are the octets that we make all the octal numbers out of. In binary, zero and one, those are the bits that we make all those numbers out of. And then we have hexadecimal. This is base 16. So this is zero through A, B, C, D, E, F. So that is the hex tests that make up the hexadecimal language, zero through nine, and then A through F. Because all of our digits, our bits, our octets, our hex tests, they all have to be a single character long for us to build up numbers. All right, and uh, so we need to have a way of representing a 10, and then we say that with an A. An 11 is a B, a 12 is a C, a 15 is an F, all right? So if we're writing a number in hexadecimal format, the language that we use has those characters in it. That's the alphabet, if you will. In octal, this is our alphabet. In binary, this is our alphabet. And in decimal, we have zero to nine, okay? We can think of these just like natural languages that human beings speak. This is English. This is Telugu. This is, um, I don't know, Spanish. Um, uh, do we have somebody from Brazil here? I don't remember. Portuguese, you know. So each of these languages have their own alphabet, right? And we have different letters or whatever in those languages, but they all are solving the same problem. They're all representing human language, human communication. Just like I can take the number 27 and I can, the, the decimal number 27, and I can represent that same number in binary using just zeros and ones. I can represent that same number in octal using zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. I can represent that same number in hexadecimal using zero through nine and A through F. The number is the same. The magnitude of that value is the same. We're just saying it using a different language. All right. Now, when we think about computers, we use decimal because humans are involved. We use binary because computers are involved. Now, octal is 
it's very commonly used at the CPU level when we're talking about like assembly language or something, but we'll skip that just for time here. And let's just think about hexadecimal here. The purpose of hexadecimal is, uh, um, well, we kind of have two, two things here, but we're gonna talk about purpose of this guy. We're gonna say hexadecimal allows us to write large values in a smaller footprint. And I'll just pick my favorite hexadecimal number. Um, this will at least will show you a minor example here. So the hexadecimal number BAD, that's in base 16. That guy is equal to 2989 in base 10 or in decimal. So I can use four digits to represent this number, or I can use three hextets to represent that number. And as your values get larger and larger and larger, you can imagine that hexadecimal gets disproportionately smaller in physical size than decimal will get. And you can imagine if I said 2989 in binary, you'd have a whole bunch of zeros and ones out on the screen. It still represents that same magnitude. That number has a meaning to it, right? I'm just using a different language. So if I'm gonna say 2989 in binary, and I wanna do the math right now, but uh, here, let's see. Uh, 2989, pop it up real quick. Yeah, it'll be a bunch of zeros and ones. <laughs> Basically, you'll take this guy, you'll divide it by uh, uh, two, over and over and over again uh, until you get a whole bunch of zeros and ones recording the remainder. All right. Um, so those are the purposes for these different number systems. Humans, computer. Now hexadecimal has two benefits. One is it allows us to represent large numbers and small footprints. Secondarily, we have a trick. In fact, I'll actually do the uh, I don't know why I didn't do this a second ago. So BAD, this is 10, I'm sorry, this is 11, 10, 13. A B is an 11, a 10 is a A, and a 13 is a D. The hexadecimal number system, these hextets, a zero, well, the biggest hexadecimal number is an F. That's the number 15. The number 15 is 1111. You can represent a single hextet in four bits. So that means if I'm making an 11, I'll say this is a one in the eighth place, a zero in the fours place, a one in the uh, twos place, and a one in the ones place. That is the binary version of the number 11. This is eight plus two, plus one, that's an 11. This is eight, plus two, plus zero, that's a 10. For 13, this is eight, plus four, plus zero, plus one, that's a 13. This is the binary version of BAD in hex. One, zero, one, 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 zero, one, zero, one, one, zero, one. A whole bunch of zeros and ones translates to the same value translates to the same value in binary. So BAD is equal to 2989 is equal to all these ones and zeros. All three of those are the same value. All right? But we're representing them using different number languages. Why hexadecimal? Because we have this trick. We can fully use four bits in bit space to represent all of the hextets in hexadecimal. An F is one, 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 and a zero is zero, 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 zero. All the other ones are all the bits in between. So we can do this little trick where we can go from a single hextet to a four bit binary number directly.